Yeah, I'm starting classes today at nine in the morning. Okay, that's what you say, class. <laughs> research, becoming a researcher, and topics of business. Okay, so I'm going to the fundamentals right now. Cool. Yeah, I'm excited about it. That's awesome. It's fantastic. Yeah. I'm with you guys, going to be 12, 15 years in the future. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm going to begin because the sooner we begin, the more we can cover and we can talk Absolutely. about it. Yeah. 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 Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Okay, so I'm Edgar Asensio, just to make sure. All of you, welcome to my class, 1031 Exchange. My background is real estate. My career has been real estate all my life. I got my broker's license in 2000, so that's like more than 20 years ago. And I own buildings. I own my office building as well. And I do represent a group of investors that they have purchased at a minimum total over 100 buildings over the past at least 15 years, you know? So that's my experience. I am also the co-chair of the Real Estate Advisory Council. How many of you guys have heard about the Advisory Council, the real estate? Okay. How many of you are part of the Real Estate Society? Okay, great, awesome. So many years ago, my friends, some professors, we co-founded the Real Estate Alumni Group, and then we also formed the Real Estate Advisory Council. And so what we want to do, we want to make sure that this real estate education and business network for you and for our alums. So anyway, so I, I am the co-chair of the Alumni Relations Committee with my friend John, he's the, an attorney from San Francisco. So both of us, we are leading the, the, the committee. I have done over 100 transactions in real estate. And it's... Very important for you guys to know on the big picture, the different sectors of real estate, okay? I'm gonna begin by saying that there's one sector that is called commercial real estate, right? So it begins from residential, commercial, and then you have agricultural, right? So today we're gonna to separate everything. We're gonna make it like super clear because we have to know the fundamentals we can before we continue. Okay, so it's super important. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Come on in. Make yourself comfortable. Do we have extras? Yeah, there should be these on your table. Just make sure you grab them. For handouts. I just introduced myself. I'm Edgar Asensio. I'm the broker. And I've been in the industry for uh, at least 15 years. You know? So this is what we're going to be covering today, but before we cover everything that I'm going to talk to you guys about, I want to get a feel of who you are, you know? So if you don't mind, ladies first, let's go in the back. Just tell me why you want to be in this class, and if you have any affiliation to real estate somehow, anything related to real estate, talk to me. Just give me 30 seconds of your life about real estate. Go. And there's no right or wrong answer, by the way, okay? It's growing marketing making. By the way, and that's the reason why I'm repeating what you're saying right now, because real estate is not someone in real estate. It's not for someone who knows finance. It's not for someone who knows accounting or economics. And we're gonna look at one of the slides you all of you represent the industry. Go ahead, continue going. Um, my dad's a real estate broker, so I've been just like around a lot of like real estate transactions, and I'm just interested to learn like more about like um, how to finance real estate and like I don't know. That's great. That's fantastic. By the way, welcome. Did you guys hear what she said? 
She's not a newbie. Her dad is a broker. Did I get that right? You understand that your generation is ahead of my generation. When I started in the business, basically, you know, I had to learn everything from, from the beginning, you know? So you are already the second generation. And right now, what we're gonna do in about 10 minutes, we're gonna pick it up so quick. Right now, we're just doing the final fundamental because I want you guys to have in your mind that it's possible to buy these buildings. Somebody owns that shopping center. Someone owns that big building where you live, two, three, four, five story building. You have the capacity to do that, you know? But we'll, as we go along, we're gonna talk about all the transactions that I have done. Welcome. Next. Yeah, ladies first. <laughs> Um, I'm Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Uh, great visit. Um, I, uh, I've been in the real estate study for a couple years. I was the main in for a while, kind of leaned away from it, but I'm still planning on. Um, I, I mean, any education is good. Was I agree. And eventually, I've come on learning some properties, so just learning about that is very and I, that. And I want to tell you, you know what, for all of you, our careers are not linear. We're gonna go through different paths, right? So even if you are, you say, you know what, I'm only gonna be in real estate, I'm only gonna be in finance, accounting, entrepreneurship, I can assure you that your ideas will evolve, you know? So I'm glad that you have that main mindset because let's learn and then see what opportunities come in our life and it's based also on your skill set and your personality, right? So it's good that you're doing that because you comp compare and contrast. Oh, I don't connect with this one, but this sector is better. This maker is better. So that's the mindset. So today, all of us, we're gonna be on the, on the same plane level, okay? We're gonna be like no subjective, neutral, okay? Objective, right? So objective, right? Yeah, neutral. So welcome. Next. Entrepreneurship. Um, and I'm interested because I'm going to go towards wealth management and yeah. realize that real estate is a good thing. Did you say wealth management? Wealth management, we're connected to private equity. It's fancy, catchy. You need to learn a lot of finance and so far. So every part of real estate is connected to all these different subsectors. You, you need to know this. Like this is mandatory. If you want to be in wealth management, if you want to be in finance, accounting, you need to know that. If you want to, if you're an entrepreneur who have that entrepreneurial spirit and you want to buy buildings, you need to know that. Everything I'm going to be teaching you today is mandatory. You have to know it. Okay. Welcome. I'm Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Um, I'm an accounting and finance double major. Accounting and finance. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That's beautiful. Yes. By the way, did I make the announcement today where I'm coming from right now? What did I say? And what am I doing? And that's right. You know what's the foundation? What you said. Accounting. So accounting and finance super important. Okay, super important to learn that. Here, because we're gonna take it to the next level and build models. You know, and and do a lot of financial analysis, right? But we're gonna first let's let's do the foundation first. Okay. So I'm glad that you're in this class. You have that background. Okay? Next. Hi, I'm Shiraya. I'm, Hi, Shiraya. A, I'm a business major. Business major. And I recently learned that real estate is just not sales. So I'm here to learn more about all the various avenues of real estate. Um, so possibly you know, somewhere further down the road, maybe I'll be in one of the sectors. That's right. In, in all. Not only that, buy the building. What's the building going to give you? Cash flow, income. You can find a, a job in wealth management and then on your buildings, give you passive income. That is, isn't that amazing? Beautiful. Okay, let's go with the boys. Go in the front. Um, Torin. Time out. I just forgot that. You're next. Um, I'm Alex. I'm a marketing major. Marketing. And um, the question was why I'm interested in real estate. Yes. Um, 
I don't know. I just find it very interesting, and I'm trying to build. Which part do you find interesting? Um, I guess like sales and like debt management, that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm well, looking to build generational wealth. Did you say intergenerational wealth? Yeah. Oh. You understand that's going to be part of my thesis? <laughs> that word, it, it will be. By the way, that's what that's part of my research uh, question that we have. Welcome. Lloyd. Uh, I'm Boring. I'm an entrepreneurship major. Entrepreneurship? Yeah. yeah, I'm interested in real estate just from an investment perspective. Investment? I'd love to invest in real estate as soon as I can. Just kind of seeing. As soon as possible. As soon as I can. Yeah. And, and I want to tell you, everything's come. I'm telling you right now, digest it. Feel it because as soon as I leave here, I'm gonna to to go back to my office. Mm -hmm. I work 10, 12 hours a day, every day. I have my own corporation. I love what I do. I represent clients. As soon as I have clients, they call me and say, Erica, sell my 10 unit building because I wanna buy 20 units. My money. Next. Hi, I'm Archer Smith. I'm a freshman marketing major. Fresh. You are a freshman and you're in this class? You you have an excellent mindset. I think I was like a, a, a senior when I started thinking about real estate. Yeah. You are like three, four years ahead of me. Thank you. So I'm glad that you started soon. Mm -hmm. Continue. Yeah, I'm just looking to expand my knowledge. Welcome. A little bit more on the um, market of real estate, definitely investment opportunities, um, but also just the background, learning the terminology and the lingo. So I'm also hoping to double in finance. So Got that background would be great. Fantastic. Next. Uh, I'm Will. I'm a finance major. Finance. I'm a junior. I just transferred from the University of Oregon. Um, Oregon. Yeah. Uh, Close to White City? Huh? White City? What What part of Oregon? Eugene. Eugene. Got it. Um, I, I'm interested in real estate because my dad is a property investor for commercial real estate. That's oh, he is? I'm doing at the college. Uh, yeah. Welcome. We have two ladies that came in. Ladies, first, we're going to why real estate, why are you taking this class? If you can share with us. Okay. Um, for me, I grew up really support my mom talking about real estate. And yeah. I grew up it, yeah. Um, and it's just everything. I'm also on the real estate board. So I'll just come to Thank you. Welcome. What's your name? My name is Carly. Nice to meet you. By the way, uh, before we continue, you mentioned the word real residential right now. So we're gonna get it straight today, once and for all, about the sectors, okay? It's simple to learn, but now I want you guys to always remember what to say when you talk about real estate, okay? Remember we said residential, one sector, commercial, right? And just agriculture, okay? I am not in agriculture and I am not residential. So I am in commercial real estate. So you have commercial, right? Under commercial, you have subsectors. Multifamily, office space, mixed use, industrial. One more time, right? Commercial, right? Ready? Multifamily. What's multifamily? Apartment buildings. Apartment buildings, right? Office space. What's office space? Office buildings, right? Got it? Mixed use. Mixed use is when you have first level offices, plus on the second, third, fourth floor. Apartment buildings, right? Units, right? We're still commercial, right? Mixed use. Then you have retail. And then you have industrial. One more time. Commercial, right? Multifamily, got it? We have Retail, got it? Office space, got it? Industrial and retail. Who can tell me what's the sectors of commercial real estate? Let's do it all together. Give me one. One sector, subsector of commercial real estate. Give me one. Multifamily. Multifamily. Office space. Office space. Retail. Retail. Mixed use. Mixed use. Industrial. Industrial. Commercial, commercial, yes, it was underneath commercial. Retail, multifamily, industrial, office space, mixed use, retail. Got it? 
crystal clear, right? We are going to talk about industrial. Question, is industrial part of commercial real estate? We said, yeah, you said it, right? Under industrial, then you have subsect after that sector of industrial, you have a, a lower tier, right? Light industrial, heavy industrial, storage, warehouses, got it? Under industrial, we have light industrial, right? Heavy industrial. What does it mean between light and heavy? Think about it. Think about a big semi truck. Zzz. A big semi truck can go into heavy because the, the concrete is thicker. Right? The zone is, is, is a different zone. Light, the truck's coming, right? Okay. And then I said warehouse. What's warehouse? Storage. Who goes to Costco? Who knows somebody who owns a Tesla? Whatever Tesla is made, the batteries, whatever Costco is, that's warehouse. Got it? Right? Question Is industrial part of commercial real estate? It is, right? And then we have under industrial, we have in, in Light industrial, heavy industrial, and then we have what else? Warehouse, Warehouse right? Okay. So those are the, the sectors. Who can tell me what are the sectors of commercial real estate? Got it. Tell me. Multi-family. Everybody agree? Yeah. Everybody agree? Multi-family. Okay. Retail. Retail. Everybody agree? Got it. Office space. Agree? Office space? Industrial. Industrial? What's under industrial? Light heavy warehouse. Got it, right? Simple, right? What's next? Mixed use. Mixed use. Excellent. I need a, a second person who can tell me what's under commercial real estate. Go. Office space, retail, mixed use, industrial. Got it. Did he miss anything? Did he say mixed use? You say retail? Do you say multifamily? Do you say office space? From this point on in your life, you got it crystal clear. Question. We're gonna go more in detail. I have a two-unit building, duplex. I have a triplex. Is that commercial? No. That's true. So that's what we're gonna separate residential with commercial. Okay. Residential to commercial. And right away, what I'm telling you right now is based on the guidance of all the lending institutions in the whole United States. When you go apply for a loan, one to four units, still residential. If it's five units, now you're under commercial. Who can repeat what I just said right now? Did you follow me? I want to say one more time. The difference between residential, commercial, residential is one unit. When you leave primary residence, one unit, up to four units. If it's five units and above, five, 100, 200, 2,000 units, it's going to be multi, multi family under commercial. Who can tell me the difference between residential and commercial? Uh, residential has up to four units. Crystal clear. Got it? Okay, last question. Tell me all the commercial sectors, please. If you can, just give me one. Yeah. Got it. What's your name? Rudy. 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 Rachel. Rachel. Was he right? He was right, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Tell me what's commercial. What are the sectors in commercial real estate? Give me one. Just one. Multifamily. Just keep in mind that your apartment buildings. All who lives in an apartment right now? All of you guys live. Do you live in a commercial building or a residential building? You live in a commercial building because it's a multifamily. As long as it's more than five units. Bless you. Right? So multifamily is commercial. 
Who can tell me another subset of commercial? Mixed use. Mixed use. Give me another one. Office space. Industrial. Industrial. One more. Retail. Retail. So we got crystal clear, right? So the lecture today is all about commercial. It's all about income coming in. It's all about financial statements, financial analysis, models based on that income coming from all those units that are five and above. Got it? Okay, so this is who we are, okay? All of us. We're here. Can you do the honors? Can you read the first one, please? Uh, real estate investments, exchanging and acquiring properties, increases portfolio performance. Give me the next one. Fostering entrepreneurial spirit, a driver for growth and opportunity. And then financial engineering achieves investment value add by optimizing tax liability, reducing financing costs, increasing cash flow, and unlocking dormant equity. Okay. Who can connect with this one? Entrepreneurial spirit. Raise your hand. Who can connect with real estate investments? How about engineering, financial engineering? All of you finance majors, you are here. How many finance majors right now? All of you that raise your hand, you are here, okay? Right here. This is who you are, okay? So real estate is at the intersection of all of these three pillars, okay? If you connect to these three pillars, this you can consider this as your career. You can consider it as any as become an investor. So the reason why I put it here, so I just want you guys to put in context, you know, that if you want to choose this as a career or perhaps a second career in addition to your job that you may have, you know, so this is who you are. When I first got my broker's license, I made a decision to not go work for someone. By the way, my decision, I don't, um, it's very subjective, it's part of my personality, but there is a decision that I made, but I wanna share with you who I am, okay? I did not want to go rent an office space. I didn't wanna go give money to someone so they can use it for the mortgage. I wanted to have my company and I wanted to buy the building where my company is gonna be. So I purchased this building. How many of you guys familiar with Torrance? Tito Torrance? A little bit? Who lives close to Torrance? Where about? Okay, in the back? Where? Your prairie? All of you guys know, if you don't know in the area, I am on prime location here. I'm on Torrance Boulevard. So when I got my broker's license, what I did was I went ahead and I went to apply for an SBA loan. Okay? My dad is a civil engineer. He taught me to do financial statement and to apply for the loan. I got approved for the loan. Actually, they asked me, Edgar, do you have any collateral? Who knows what's collateral? How much assets that you have that they can pay back? Assets that you have, right? Who tell me what's collateral? Somebody else? It's like something you give to show that you're like serious and you're gonna pay off. That's exciting asset, right? Got it? Crystal clear, right? Everybody with me, right? By the way, this is like at least like almost 20 years ago, okay? I applied for the loan. I went for the interview. They asked me, can you show me your collateral? Did I have collateral at that time? I'm you, right? Zero collateral, right? Keep in mind, guys, that if you have a vision, right, and you have opportunities, you take it. You take it, all right? So, and, and also, you, I hate to say this, but it's the truth. Sometimes you need a little luck. You can have be an expert in something. You can have a lot of money, but you also need a little luck. 
So, or somebody took help you. That happened to me. The president of the bank, okay, Mr. Asensio, I see that you have your financials here. I see that you're motivated. I see that you have a vision. I'm going to do a collateral for you. You know what they did? I have no collateral. I set up my own entity. I set up a corporation. And they tell me, you can set up your corporation, but if something goes wrong, we're going to take over your business. Did I care? You take the business. I know I'm not going to fail. I'm not, not going to fail. I have zero clients and only my down payment. Okay? So they approve my loan. I think that they approved it like in, like in the morning. At 12, 1 p.m., I started driving, trying to find properties. By the way, this is the time when there's no Trulia, Zillow, and all the platforms right now, you know? Bottom line is that I passed by this building, talked to the owner, and I told him what happened, right? I got this loan, I wanna buy a building. So he went ahead and approved it, okay? So I purchased this building. How did I approve this building? This was beautiful when you become a broker, when you become an owner of a brokerage company, you don't have to share too much of your commission, got it? It's okay to share, right? If you have employees, but I'm, I'm the owner, so I have my broker's license and I also have my officer license, right? Officer's license is for my corporation, right? So look at my down payment. How many transactions did I do to make my down payment? This is a fact, by the way. I'm sharing this with you because I, I this is how I purchased my first office building. Three transactions here, 35% down. My SBA loan with 65%. Do the honors, can you read what it says right here? It's future commercial real estate business sales transactions as collateral to get commercial loan. Got it. So learn this from you, for you guys, okay? There's a possibility, there's always a possible way to get a loan. And we're gonna be talking about the rates and all that, but who cares about rates? If you're gonna be approved for a loan, take it. Take it. You still, you have a, at least like 30, 40, 50 years ahead of you. Okay, you take it, okay? Anyway, so I bought this building, that's my lobby. So I just wanted to share this story for, with you guys, but this is a fact. I, this is my first, I, I'm proud. I'm proud to be there. When my clients come in, they feel that I'm stable. You know, I'm not going nowhere. I'm not leasing a place that five, two, three, four, five years later, I'm gonna go to another office. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. It's just a decision that I made. Got kind of proud of it, like pride, you know? It, it, it's just who I am, right? I wanted to buy the building where my office is gonna be. Right, and I've been there all these years, right? So when I have my meetings with clients, they feel good, you know? Be there in my office, we'll go upstairs, have a meeting, and see how we're gonna be uh, having strategies to buy a building, you know? I have a question. Yeah. So you open the C Corp, so like an LLC? That's right. Let's talk about that, right? How many different entities can you open? Give me one right now. You said C Corporation, right? S Corp. S Corp, right? What else? LLC, right? LLP. LLP. Guys, right now, did you hear what I said right now when we talk about it? We just mentioned four entities. What can you do? What can you do with those entities? The word is what can you do with those four entities? So with a C. That's right. I did that. Got it? But you have to have a vision. This is why we have to learn. Who said that you want to learn? One of you, right? You want to learn, right? So little things like that, it makes you ready to have a vision, you know? And, and, and to move forward, right? Because you know the facts, right? So now you know, you got something new today. Okay. So yeah, that's C Corporation S. The difference between C and S, C is corporation, its own entities, has its own tax ID. S, the shareholder, 
interest. So whatever income that make the company makes, it goes into your personal tax return. You know, that's a big difference. But it's still an entity. So this, this is what's happening right now in the market. Okay. Investors are freeing their equity. In resort investors, the values are going up. Why not? How many of you guys are renting right now? Okay. Do you think that rent that you're paying right now, two years ago was the same rent, rental rate? What do you think? It was less or more? Two years ago, it was less or more? Less, right? How about five years ago? Was it more or less? Uh -huh. Wait, how about 10 years ago? If, if you say way, way less, way, 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 way less, that you got it. That's right, but keep in mind, right? Is the rent rental rate are gonna go decrease this year, next year? No. Are this is gonna keep going up. It's not gonna stop. Got it? It's not gonna stop, right? So we have to be on the other side, right? Right? We have to be on the other side. Yeah. Maybe that's what we're gonna get to that right now. And actually, I just gave you one example how you can counteract. You become a broker. You represent clients, you make commissions, you save money, and you have a down payment. You, your sister, somebody else, right, can get together as a partnership. There are grants available. Many people do not know sometimes they have grants available. That's another way. Another way, I'm gonna jump into my, my slides, but this is important for you, to your comments. You know that you can buy property with 95% leverage, 5% down? You got it. You got it. You got it. Do I care how much rate am I going to borrow? By the way, generally speaking, of course you care. But you have a lifestyle ahead of you. If somebody approves it for a loan, you take it. If somebody's going to give you 100% financing, you take it. Okay. Nice observation that you made. That's real. Today we're, we're talking real. All of us are on the same page. Okay. Optimal holding period. What do you think? How many years do investors? By the way, this answer I'm going to give you is based on 1,000, 1 million, but almost 1.6 million of transactions. This is a fact. I can prove it, I can quantify it, okay? There are papers about it, okay? You buy a building today, when is the op optimal time that you can sell that property and buy another property? Who said between three to five years? Okay, good guess. How about between five and eight years? Good guess. How about nine to 12 years? Who said between five to eight? Who can tell me why you said that? Just give me a reason. It's good reason. What did you say? Say it again. Say it again. Uh, loud, please. I think seven years is like the average time to sell house where they sell it times. If they hold the house for refinancing reason or sell it, it changes to something else. Is there a real estate cycle that happens like after the eight years? You guys are super smart. The answer is there's always a cycle. There's always a cycle. You, you're trying to, to put uh, some indicators, right? You're right. That what do you think? By the way, that's the answer to the question. Five to eight. That's the optimum. By the way, I used to have this fallacy. I have to hold this building forever, or like 20 years, or 10. This is proven. 
okay? five to eight years. Okay? You talk a little bit about why that is. Five eight years just kind of how it is. But this is based on one million six hundred transactions. Mm -hmm. They put they do correlation, they do a correlation matrix, yeah. they did some methodology, and they concluded, they quantified gotcha. it, and they came out to that number. Yeah. Well, but what's their reasoning? Like we're What's their reasoning behind that? Like, who knows why are they selling between those? Who uh, who knows a little statistics? Predictive? What's that? What does that mean? Well, they have to predict where the demand is going to be, like for the housing. So they see, like, oh, this corporation opened up a big company. There's going to be a lot of people here looking for jobs. I should buy real estate there because it's an up and coming city. But eventually that demand kind of slopes off as like companies are developed there and people have their housing. So that's when uh, the more times so you're right. That's the demand and supply. So hundred percent is the economy, you know. There's 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 all these factors come in effect. You know, it's a whole study about that, by the way. Years of study about that, you know. But I chose that one because I it's connected to what I do. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Okay, I want to put things in perspective, okay? 2022, look how many times the feds increase the rates. Even before that, look what happened in 2021. Cap rate compression. Remember COVID, 2000, 2021? During COVID, the rates dropped. They dropped, look at this. A hundred, uh, they, they dropped 125 basis points. So remember a lot of people were like purchasing properties because the rates were so low, you know? But after 2022, the rates went up seven times. 2023, four times. You guys heard that the real estate sector in the past two, three years has slowed down, sales velocity decreased. And there's a phenomenon going on, which is that the usually if the rates go down, usually what happens to prices? Increasing. Right? The opposite should happen, right? If the rates go up, what happens to prices? Should go down, right? Rates go up, the prices should go down, right? Has the prices of real estate gone down in the past two, three years? No. That's a phenomenon that's happening, okay? Do you know why all my clients are even more excited today, as a matter of fact? What day is today, Friday? Do you guys know what happened last Wednesday? Anybody can tell me what happened? Yeah, what happened Wednesday? Got it! What happened Wednesday? For how much? 50 basis point. It's a huge event. Look, 22, seven times. 23, four times, right? And did they pass, pass, December, January pass. All this year, pass, and all the, the, all the meetings that they have. Capital markets, private equity, Real estate investment, they are all been waiting, including myself and my clients, we've been waiting for like three, four, since 2021. We've been waiting for that moment that happened. When? When did it happen? When did it happen, the 50 basis point? Wednesday. We're real right now, what's happening right now. You're taking this class at the right time in your lifetime. The reason I'm bringing this up because I want you guys to put in perspective how huge that is. Opportunities, don't let them pass by. Okay? You are going to be looking at a switch in the market. There's a shift. Okay? It's a paradigm shift. Okay? There's an inflection point. Who knows what is inflection point? Anybody? What's an inflection point? Inflection point on the graph where it starts to change the direction. Got it, everybody? Inflection point? Change direction, right? Go like this, right? Or you can go this way, right? It happened on Wednesday. So what happened on Wednesday? 
Uh, That's right. I just want to tell you guys that this huge event, because it's just the beginning of a cycle, is going to happen again. Nobody can predict the future, but that's the projection. Another maybe 25 basis point before the end of the year, if it doesn't happen, it will happen next year, and it's going to continue happening. The reason you have all this increase in rates is because you are trying to put reduce inflation. Inflation was 9%. Then it went down to 8, 7, 6, 5. So now what's inflation? Anybody? Two high twos. They, they're almost three. Yeah, yeah, correct. So it, it's, it's almost there. They want, their target is two, right? Can you imagine from nine to two? But sac who sacrificed the real estate market, right? Anyways, so I just want to give you a little uh, prelude to the meeting that we have the session today. This is uh, my client on this building of 235th in Torrance, four units, okay? When the rates went down, the interest rate that you get, it was like less than 4%. So what was happening at that time is called cap rate compression. The value of properties went up without increasing the income of the property. So I had a lot of clients calling me, telling me, Edward, let's do a 1031 exchange, let's exchange into another property. You know? So I just want to give you a little prelude to what we're going to be talking about, the 1031, but we did this one. Yeah. I sold this building for units for my client, but property in Granada Hill for his son and for the daughter. Uh, it's a cabin in Crestline. So I just wanted to tell you, I put this uh, picture here for you guys to just put this in perspective, okay? That you go with the flow. If the rates go up, there's a way that you can structure a loan. If the rates go down, there's another way that you can structure a loan, okay? So what is 1031 exchange? Can you do the honor? Can you read the top? Yeah. What is the temporary rent chain? Is the tax saving tool? In 1912, the federal government created a tax deferred exchange that allows investors to keep the basis and take the basis with them to the next property. Got it? Can you read this one here? Yeah. Okay. Of the 1031 exchange, keep the gain, not pay the taxes on the gain. Take the gain to the next property. Shift your gain to a better property for you so you can re leverage the equity create more income, appreciation, tax write-offs, to go into a to go into better areas, newer properties. Not not tax-free, but tax deferred. Got it. So 1031 exchange, the bottom line of all this slide, when you heard what is 1031 exchange, it's a method to defer or postpone. A lot of people tell me that's a nicer word, postpone, you know, taxes. You sell your commercial building today. You have to pay taxes the moment that you touch that money. That's your capital gains. If you do a 1031 exchange, you don't pay the taxes. You defer those taxes in the future and forever if you can, or you can transfer to the next generation. Okay, but there's methods to do it. I'm gonna teach you how to do that. Okay. So it's like kind real of estate transaction. Have you heard? You guys heard that if I buy an office building, 20 units, if I buy an older family, I have to buy another property that is the same like kind. This word here, because this is a IRC, Internal Revenue Code, it has nothing to do with the structure. Like kind is the value. Okay, it's the value. If you sold a property to 500000 and then you have to defer the taxes and do a 1031 exchange, you got to buy another property for the same value or more. Okay? So I'm going to tell you guys the first rule right here, okay? You're going to be selling the property today. The name of the property you're going to be selling is called 
replacement property. By the end of the day today, we're gonna identify what type of property we're talking about, okay? You're gonna be selling the replacement property and you're gonna be buying, selling a relinquished property, excuse me, and buying a replacement property. Relinquish for a replacement property. This transaction, you have to finish in 180 days, okay? Day one, the day that you sell the property. So the IRS gives you 45 days that you have, have to identify what you're gonna be selling and what you're gonna be buying, okay? If you sold it today, there's a piece of paper that they're gonna put a stamp. So the clock start ticking today, okay? So you have 45 days to identify the property that you're gonna be buying. If it's 180 days that I have to complete the transaction and you have to identify in 45 days, how many days are left to complete the transaction? 135. 135. Everybody with me? Can you repeat what I, what I said right now? How many days do we need to complete the transaction? 180 days, right? Between one day, day one to 180 days. So we, 180 days to complete the transaction. Of course, you can complete it in less time. Okay? So you have 45 days to identify the property. Can you identify the property on day 46? Yes? No? You cannot. Have to be in 45. Because that, that's, a, that's, a, that's part of the code. Okay? So you identify the property is going to be replacing. So you sold the relinquished property, you're going to buy the replacement property. Okay. You see right here, there's three rules. We have to match the rules. Okay. You have to pick one of these three rules. By the way, this is the history of the 1031 exchange. Bottom line is that this family, the Barker and his son, They wanted to buy all these buildings. They own land, timberland. And they wanted to buy all these buildings from this company, the Crown Company. More than 100 buildings. The government said no, because he wanted to complete the transaction in five years. They took the government to court and they won the case. As a result of that hearing, there's the rule that you can depreciate the property into 27.5 years or 39 years, and you have to complete the transaction in 180 days and 45 days to identify the property. So basically, that's the history of the 1031 exchange. The rule stays the same, hasn't changed since 1921. You sell a relinquished property, you buy a replacement property. Keep in mind that you cannot touch that money, right? So you need a third party who can hold up those funds on your behalf. Can you do the honors and read this one here? Exchanger? Yeah. Is that, is that how you pronounce it, exchanger? That's right. A person who is the owner of a relinquished property. That's right. So you have the relinquished property, you have business property. Can you read what it says here? A company that facilitates Internal Revenue Code IRC Section 1031 tax deferred exchanges. What does it say here? Accommodator. So when you do a 1031 exchange, you need an accommodator. Okay? You need somebody who's going to be holding the funds on your behalf. By the way, who's controlling online? Does, do we have any shots online? Um, no, some people are answering the question. Okay, got it. Thank you. So you need an accommodator to hold the funds. So, so you sell the relinquished property, the money goes to the accommodator, and then you find a replacement property, and the accommodator is going to buy that property on your behalf. Got it?
we're going to talk about terminology. So what we'll do right now, let's just take a five minute break. Okay, is that okay? Let's take a five minute break and come back in five minutes and then we can continue the conversation, okay? Thank you. So I have a name that's uh, kind of over her head. I'm talking about that. And then I that was fine. Uh, am I still going to get credit for that day? Because I'm just scanning the QR code. Yeah, it's going to be in the survey. Uh, uh, a question. Oh, I wasn't here.
Um, yeah, I just want to keep following up for last week's time that we are at the deeper end of the summer. Thank you very much. Yeah, just remind me. And then what, what else are my minutes for the yeah. Okay. So, like, this one and another one, and we'll have it, or what? Yeah, I think so. But I don't think it all I don't think it all Okay, let's continue. You sign on. Okay, so we're back. I had it in my pocket. Okay, let's continue. Who can tell me the different sectors of commercial real estate? But now the question is going to be who is online? Who are online? The names of the person? Give me the names. Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Alexander. Alexander. George. George. Michael. Leah. Leah. Robert. Robert. And another Michael. And who? Another Michael. And another Michael. Mm -hmm. We have two Michael. So online, who can tell me the different sectors of commercial real estate? Just give me one. Oh, we're able to see the mirror. Great. It's at the bottom. Yeah. Click. We're gonna read the answer here in the uh, in the classroom. Oh, got it. Where's the the answer? Right here. Okay, got it. Can you do the honors? Oh yeah. Um. Okay. What did George say? George said industrial. Is industrial a sector of commercial real estate? Yes. Thumbs up. Yeah. We agree with you, George. Kevin. Residential, commercial, and industrial. Kevin, is he right or he's semi-right? 50%, 75%? 50%. Now we know we're in the right class and we're using the percentages now, right? Robert, commercial. Commerce. Robert. What are the, just give me one sector, please, of commercial real estate. Just give me one. Leah, commercial. The question is, give me one sector of commercial real estate. 
this help them? Um, multifamily. Got it. Who said that? Kevin. Kevin, you're right. Say exactly right. Okay. Next, one more. What did Robert say? Office. Robert, you're right. Office space. Great. So we're missing, we got multifamily, office space. What else do we need? Retail. Huh? Retail. retail. Got it, retail. Industrial. Huh? Industrial. Industrial? Mixed use. Excellent, right? In the back row, last two back rows, right? Have you ever heard this question? It's connected to industrial. Ready? Is industrial part of commercial real estate? Yes. In the back. Naming the subsectors of industrial real estate. In the back. Just give me one. You got it. Give me another one. Got it. He, she said light. Light industrial. She said warehouse. Give me another one. Heavy online. Heavy industrial. One more. Tesla, Costco, those are the hands. You got it. Do you hear everybody what he said? Manufacturing. Isn't that great? Isn't that fantastic what we learned so far? This is on the academic practitioner level. Forever you're gonna remember this. I can assure you 50% even of agents out there do not know this, what you learned today, okay? In the back, who can tell me the subsectors of industrial real estate? Huh? Warehouse? Huh? Light? Heavy? Got it, one more? Manufacturer and warehouse. Just keep, remember just Tesla and Costco. Tesla when they make the batteries, like, a, like all these almost millions of batteries, right? Costco, right? Where Costco is, right? Okay. Who can tell me the subsectors of industrial real estate? Anybody? All of them. Heavy. One moment. Let's learn with you. Sorry. Heavy, heavy industrial, light, industrial, light industrial, warehouse, warehouse manufacturing. manufacturing. You got it. Simple. Got it. Right? Isn't that great? So let's run it one more time. And that's going to be the last time. Got it? Okay. Tell me all the subsectors of commercial real estate. All the subsectors. Are you, are you ready? Commercial real estate? Yeah. yeah. Can you 90% ready? 100% ready. Oh my God. Do you, see, that's a message why I asked that question because when you go apply for a loan, when you go make a decision with your wife, your husband, your friend, your partner, whomever, you have to be certain the decision that you make, assertive. Remember what I did when I bought my building? I'm in my 20s. I don't know. I have nothing in the bank. No collateral, but I knew that I wanted to buy the building where my office is going to be, right? He's 100% that he knows the answer. So that's how you're going to be assertive, right? You learn, you, you read, you have experience, assertive, right? Are you 99%? No. Okay. All the class work with you. Okay? Let's do it. Commercial sectors. Office space. Office space. Retail. Retail. Mixed use. Mixed use. Industrial. Industrial. Multifamily. Multifamily. Round of applause. Isn't that great? Welcome. Okay. Who can tell me all the subsectors of industrial? Yeah. No, whoever. Who can tell me? I industrial. Time out. Have a question. Are you 99%? 100%. 99.9? 9? 9. 9. 9. 9. 9. 110. Okay. You see? He is ready. You guys have, you have to be that, that way. That's why you study, you read, right? You spend 30 minutes, an hour studying, right? And you're ready for the test, right? Or to make a decision, right? 
So the question is, what are the subsector of industrial real estate? Do you have the answer? Yes. Are you 99%? A hundred percent. Okay, let's do it. Light industrial. Light industrial. Heavy industrial. Heavy industrial. Warehouse. Right. Warehouse. Store, yeah. Storage. You see it ready? You see it right? Right? Round of applause. Welcome. How are you? Doing great. Awesome. Fantastic, guys. Let's continue, okay? We talked about selling the property to a 1031 exchange, right? How many days do I need to complete the transaction to make it a hop? I think 31 exchange. What's the total time period? 180? Are you 99%? You're 100%. You are correct. 180 days. Got it? How many days do I need to identify the property? Are you 99%? You are hundred percent, right? How many days? Got it exactly. So we have day one to one hundred and eighty, right? And you got forty-five days to identify. Crystal clear, right? Okay, let's continue. You in the back, all the way in the back. Yeah. Yeah. What's your name? Genevieve. 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 Do the honors, Genevieve. What does it say here? You don't have to read, just read the title. Capital gains? Yeah. What does it say here? Right. And right here? Okay, so we're gonna learn those three words, okay? It's gonna stay with you guys forever, okay? Have you guys heard about capital gains? Who can tell me what's capital gains? You sell a property and you make a profit off of it, and then go take some part of that money. It's simple as that. I can read to you all that, but that's the bottom line. You sell for one dollar, and then you bought it for fifty cents. You have fifty cent profit. Capital gains. Crystal clear, right? That's capital gains. Okay. Like kind. Remember we talked about like kind. Is like kind be related to the structure of the building? Is it? The answer is no. Like kind is the value, okay? Value, okay? And then boot. Boot. By the way, these are words coming from the IRS code, okay? That I'm teaching you, okay? The moment that you touch that dollar when you sell the property, the moment that you touch that dollar, boot. Got it? You have to pay taxes on that. Got it? Uh, can you do the honors here in the back? You? What's your name? Oh, behind you. Yeah, what's your name? Okay. What does it say here? Any consideration can be exchanged or an exchange that's not like so basically, if you sell the property and you touch that money, and when I say touch that money, meaning that you sold the property and you don't you don't buy another one, right? You sold that relinquished property and you don't buy a replacement property. If you're gonna be selling your relinquished property and keep the money, your profits. You have to pay taxes. That's boot. Okay. That's a big no no. So don't do that. Okay. In commercial real estate, there are indicators to measure performance, values of property. And this is the language that we speak between brokers or investors. Okay. Bottom line. The one that we use the most is cap rates, okay? You can do NOI, DRM, IRR, NPV, cap rate. That's all you need to learn, okay? To compare property. One property gives you this cap rate for another cap, cap rate, so you can compare cap rates. 
What's cap rate? Who can tell me what is a cap rate? Yeah, go ahead. Got it. So what's the formula? What is the formula again? Net operating income divided by NOI. Net operating NOI, right? Yeah. Divided by market value, right? That's your cap, right? Okay. Got it? Your income the property brings after you pay all the expenses, you divide it by the value of the property. It's a simple formula. You have to learn that forever. If you're going to be buying real estate, that's all you're going to be talking about all day long. What's the cap rate on this one? What's the cap rate on the other one? Okay. So cap rate, everybody. How do we get cap rate? Online, please. Cap rate. Cap rate. Net operating income divided by sales value. The fair market value of the property. Whatever you buy the property for, that's going to be your cap rate. Okay. Okay. Got it. What's how do you get cap rate? Uh, operating income divided by the value of the property. That's right. You in the back? How do you get cap rate? You got it. Cap rate capitalization rate, right? It's that short term, right? All day long. You're going to be looking at Zillow, Trulia, all the uh, commercial real estate platforms. They're going to put that indicator there, cap rate. Okay? That's how you get cap rate. Can somebody tell me how do you get cap rate? Anybody? How do we get cap rate? What's the formula? Go ahead. And operating income divided by the value of income. That's exactly right. That's cap rate. Okay. I'm gonna let you guys to digest this slide right now. By the way, this is the slide. When I meet a new investor, I don't have to go through the whole presentation. All I gotta do is just show this slide. <laughs> what what's this number here? Okay. This there are four taxes that you have to pay. If you don't do a 1031 exchange for every dollar, you have to pay four types of taxes up to 62%. By the way, what I'm showing you right now is a fact. It's mandatory. You have to do it 100%. If you sell the property, if you don't do a 1031 exchange, you're liable for these taxes. Okay? Which are the four taxes that you pay? 20% capital gains tax. Remember, we talk about capital gains, right? The gain, right? The profit. So I have to pay 20% of that amount. Plus, you have to pay your Medicare healthcare tax is mandatory in California, 3.8, and then your state tax. What's your state tax? 13.3. And then your recapture depreciation tax. Any, uh, do we have any accounting students in the class? Okay, we have one accounting student here. We're gonna learn from him. What's your name? Great. Great. Dre, pleased to meet you, Dre. This is the heart of the 1031 exchange method. It's the heart, okay? What is depreciation? It's uh, like an asset, the value of the that's right. So it's an asset that you're going to devalue over time. Simple as that, right? Every time you buy commercial real estate, by the way, is commercial real estate three units? Two units? Yes? More than four. That's right. Five units, right? In above. Yeah. That's right. So all those properties you're going to be buying and selling, you're going to be depreciating. By the way, depreciation is like an expense. Depreciation is your best friend, okay? When you buy investment property, you're gonna be depreciating into, remember the slide that I showed you about the Stalker family that took the government to court day one? 
they're going to depreciate into 27.5 years or 39 years. Okay? 27.5 or 39 years. By the way, this is why we have our CPAs to do this, but I just want you guys to understand the concept behind, at least to, to learn, you know, to know what you're talking about, right? So if you don't do a 1031 exchange, really, how much taxes do I need to pay on depreciation? That's huge. For every dollar you have to pay one quarter. It's, not, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I show this slide to my clients and right away they tell, Edgar, uh -uh -uh. let's buy another property. Got it? 62% we have to pay. Actually, a little more than that. Right now. Yeah. Sir, are we, is there ever a way to avoid that if you want to buy another property? Is there a way to avoid that? Like, how do you end up like making profit on your final property if you decided to get out of the real estate business? Would you have to pay those capital gains no matter what? Good question, right? Everybody heard the question, right? What do you think is the answer? Yes. 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 Huh? Yes. Why? Well, because you've made, you've made, you've made a profit. You got it. And you touch the money. Yeah. Good. Remember? Good. Yes. No problem. Let's repeat it one more time. Um, when, if you Online, decide, can you hear the uh, question? Go ahead. If you decide to get out of the real estate. If you get, decide to get out, you know what? I'm out. I'm done. I want to cash out. Continue. Is there a way to still make full profit on your property or are you going to have to pay the capital gains tax? Is there a way that to avoid the 62%? I, I'm out, you know? I don't want this building no more. I want to cash out. That's what he's asking, right? So what's the answer? That's right. So, so it's mandatory. You have to do a 1031. You, you must. It's mandatory. The moment that you touch that dollar, a dollar, a million, 20 million, whatever the amount is, you pay, what percentage you pay? It's crazy. I mean, just think about it for a moment, right? Yeah. And go back. Tell us four different taxes, please. Long-term capital gains rate. Long-term capital gains, right? That's one tax that you have to pay. Healthcare tax and Medicare. Healthcare, right? Two. California state tax. California. California you have to pay taxes in California, right? Rental and business properties you can pay the recapture of the depreciation tax. You have to pay depreciation, right? The re it's called unrecaptured depreciation. So you depreciated the property since you bought it, right? Let's say you buy it today, two, three years pass by. What's the optimal time five. period? Five to eight, right? Eight years pass by, right? Year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? All this year, you took advantage of the depreciation. That is your best friend, right? Expenses, right? But now I'm going to follow what you said. I'm out. Mm -hmm. I want my money back, right? If you don't do a 1031 exchange, you pay what's called unrecaptured depreciation. Depreciation, now the government is going to tell you, okay, you took advantage all these years, now you have to pay taxes of that benefit you had. Got it? Mm -hmm. See? Could you... You file a 1031 and see like your second home. So if you had one home and then you had a portfolio of other homes that nobody lived, like that you had renters, could you file that? Like if you sold all of those, could you file that and pay for another home and not pay capital gains taxes? We're, now we're gonna speed it up right now on the on the session today because now we're gonna get into strategy right now. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody follow what he said right now. One more time. Um, if I had a portfolio, he has a portfolio of properties. And I sold the portfolio. And you sold the portfolio. Second, second home. And I file a ten thirty one for the second home. For the second home, right? Everybody, right? Okay. The answer to your question is going to come in the next slides, okay? Because we're going to be talking about. So far, everything has been pretty, right? Nice. Right? We already said that residential one to four units, 
commercial is all the sectors. Agricultural, we know you're talking about that, which isn't commercial, right? We're talking about buildings, right? So far, so good, right? Investment, right? But you know, there's always exception to rules. There's always like restrictions. There's so always something that you cannot do. But today we're gonna clarify all that, okay? All that time, because right now we're gonna be talking about the rules. But I'm just gonna give you the answer, okay? You cannot do a 1031 exchange on your second home. You cannot do a 1031 exchange on your primary residence. No. Right? But it's coming up more details about that, okay? So I just gave you the answer. You cannot do it, okay? So these are the rules. You must pick one of these three. We're going deep now, okay? You have to pick one of these three, okay? So how many days do we have to complete the transaction? 180. How many days to identify properties? 45. Got it. So we got 45 days, 135 days left, and 180 to complete. So we have between one and 45 days. What is that called, that period? Identification period to identify the properties. It's mandatory. You have to meet one of these three rules. Got it? First rule, pick one of the three, okay? First rule is a three property rule, okay? You sell the relinquished property today. How many days do I have to identify the properties? 45 days, got it? You sold the property today. We have 45 days to identify the property. Got it? So the first rule, you have to meet this three property rule. That means that within that 45 days, you, you have identified three properties you're gonna be buying. It's mandatory. You have to buy one of the three. Got it? You see now it's getting a little more restrictive now. Right? So you have identified three properties, right? They want to three, four, five. Up to five. On day 45, you have to buy one of those three, you have to open S, so you have to buy one of those three. 100%. Okay. Question Do you think that I wait on day one for my clients when the one who call me and say, Edgar, you know what? Sell me my building and I'm going to buy another one. Do you think I'm waiting on day one to find a replacement property? This is why I love my job. There's always something to do. I'm looking at properties on a daily basis because I have a client coming up tomorrow, tonight, next week. Got it? Who wants to do a 1031 exchange? I need to have something ready. I'm not going to be waiting on day one. Then with that 45 days, is nothing. Got it? So this is why I love what I do. I love to be connected with that industry. I love to meet people, to have a business net network, right? Sometimes there are properties in the market for sale that the public do not know. It's in the network. We talk to each other. Because we have clients, and you know what, this client's going to buy this building all cash. You know, here's the address. Got it? Doesn't even have to go to them. I, and I prefer to deal with them because, you know, no loan, so it's an easier transaction. But going back to our rule, right? So three proper rules, right? So you have to buy one of those three, okay? Next rule. Do the honors. Can you read the second one? 200% rule. Where you double the sales price and divide that by the value. No limit on the number of properties. So as long as the aggregate value of the properties identified does not exceed 200% of the aggregate value within each property. For example, if you identify four or more properties with a total value of up to two, of up to the limit of two times the sales price of the room of each property. Who got that? Who understood that one? Go ahead. It did. Um, so, like, as a whole, that properties that you identify, their values, like how much they cost, can't exceed two times the value of the property. That you I sold it for one million. Yeah. Can I go over what? Two. two million. Got it, everybody? I sold it for 500,000. Can I go over what? One million. I sold it for 700,000. 
cannot go over what? 1.4. Are you still with me? Got it? Cannot go over that amount. But what's beautiful about that rule? What does it say here? What does it say here? Do you see now that each one has its own conditions, right? This one is telling you identify 20, 30, 50, 100 properties, get it? But don't go over 200%. Got it? You have to, of course, you have to buy one of those, right? Crystal clear now, 200% rule. Crystal clear, everybody? Okay. Let's go to the third rule, okay? This one is applicable to portfolio. Those people in wealth management, those people in private equity, all of you finance majors or investors who wants to buy portfolio property, this is the rule that you need, okay? It's 95% rule, okay? Can you do the honors and read it, please? 95% rule? 95% rule, any number of properties. Okay, by the way, on the handout, you have that, by the way. Everybody got a handout, right? Can you look in your handout, uh, this uh, slide? Everybody got it? Can you confirm everybody got it? So this is gonna be your sheet sheet, you know, for the next 10, 20 years of your life, okay? Sheet sheet right here, right? Continue. 95% rule, any number of properties without regard to the ag uh, aggregate value must purchase on at least 95% of the value identified used in portfolio acquisition. You can have like 20 apartment buildings, five condos in a portfolio. You can have like 10 buildings, five buildings, right? And then, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna upgrade and get another portfolio of properties. So then you find another portfolio of property. So that portfolio of property you have to buy 95% of them. To make it simple, right? Out of 10, buy nine. Got it? Do with me? Everybody? Got it? Okay. Who can tell me the difference between the three property rule and the 200% rule? I'm gonna give you the answer, okay? Three property rule, it's three properties. Do I care about price? I don't care about price. I just know when I identify three properties. Got it? 200% rule. Do I care about price? I do. Can I go over 200%, right? If you sold it for 1 million, can I go over 2 million? If you sold it for 5 million, can I go over 10 million? The beautiful thing about the 200% rule is that you can buy more than four properties. 10, 20, you can do, but as long as you don't go with the 200% rule. Got it? Yeah. On what basis? On what basis? He's asking if there's a particular property, specific property, you have to do the replacement, right? Remember what you said right now, connected to like-kind. What is like-kind? Like-kind. Like what is like-kind? Similar. That's right, but it's connected to what? Anybody? Like-kind. Is it connected to the structure on the property look? Yes. It's the same aspect. Like commercial, commercial, commercial. Getting close, but almost there. Yes. Value. You got it. Got it? Like I'm in the back, who raised a hand in the back? Got it? Like I'm value. It's the value, right? So a 200% rule, don't go over that value. Doesn't matter if you're buying all condos or multifamily. Remember in the sex sub sector, let's say you, you sold an apartment building. Do you need to buy another apartment building? No. Maybe it's the value. It has nothing to do with the property type. Get it? 
if you sold a multifamily, do you need to buy another multifamily? If you buy, you sold your relinquished property is a multifamily. Do you need to buy a replacement property that is multifamily? The answer is no, you, you don't have to. And what is the reason that you don't have to? What is like like kind? Like kind is connected to what? Value. Got it? It's the value. Got it? Okay. Thank you. These are the seven benefits that are quantifiable, that have the, done financial models. I can prove it based on numbers. Finance and accounting is applicable. All the numbers you can quantify these seven benefits. Okay? This is a fact. By the way, at the end of the, you guys know at the end of the session, we asked three questions. You already know two answers, by the way. Mm -hmm. Just to give you a hint, something's coming up right now, right? So keep that in mind, right? Seven benefits. Look at this. Can you read the top if you don't mind? Uh, like a mental room. Yeah. Um, properties that are not eligible for the 1031 tax deferred exchange. Can you hit time out? What did you say of the first line? Um, Fundamentals. This one? Take a line, excuse me. Properties that are not eligible for the 1031 tax deferred exchange. Question. Can every, anybody tell me what does not eligible means? Not able to? Everybody in the back? Got it? Not eligible. That means that these are the properties that are not applicable. You cannot do a 1031 exchange. Once again, you cannot. Right? Everything we talked about was pretty nice that we can exchange to relinquish for replacement, the three property rule, the 200% rule, 95% rule. Okay? These are the ones that you cannot do. Got it? Okay. Let's go to the back, uh, second line in the back. Uh, you, can you read the first one? Yeah, yeah, got it. What's your name? Michael? Michael. How many Michaels in the house? <laughs> one. Nice meeting you, Michael. We have two Michaels online. So Michael, what's the first one? Can you tell me, Michael, what does that mean, number one? Explain to me like I'm a five-year-old. Huh? Does everybody heard what he said? What did he say? Where you live, right? Where you live, right? Right? Everybody heard? Everybody? What is that page, right? Can I do a 1031 exchange on my house where I live? Yes? Who says no? 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 99%? 100%. You cannot. Don't mix things, okay? Oh, I have a house. I go through this every day, by the way. Every day. You guys are, not, you guys are going to be teaching people who are telling you this after today. Yeah. How long do you have to rent it for it to be qualified as a rental? See what you said right now? <laughs> Can you ask the question again? How long do you have to rent out your principal residence in order for it to be qualified as a rental property? What made you ask, ask me that question? The strategy. <laughs> Did you, everybody heard what you said right now? We're talking about strategy, right? Just write what you're asking, by the way. But right now we're doing fundamentals. All right. Got it? No, you're correct where you're heading. But the answer to the question is two years, okay? 24 months, okay? That's the answer to your question, but we're gonna get deep very soon, very quickly. Got it? But Edgar, you know what? I have my home. You know what? I have this house that I saw in San Francisco, in PV, in Westchester. It's beautiful. I wanna do a 1031. Can I do that? No. Why? Because it's primary residence, right? Everybody crystal clear, everybody? Okay, second one, can you read the second one? Second one. Can you tell me what's this? 
Just tell me what is it. It's amazing when I ask this question to digest it. You can say it, but to digest it, right? In, in the context of investment, right? Yeah. What is a second home? Like I think two locations of primary residence. So we have a home here. I could have a home in New York. Got it. Everybody heard what he said? I have a house here and I have a, a cabin in, in a big bear. I have a house in New York, right? Right, two locations, right? Can I do a 1031 exchange? Huh? 99%? 100%? 100%, right? You cannot. Got it? Yeah. You cannot do a 1031. Yeah. What if you rent out that property when you're not there? I'll continue. What about it? Like, Give me a scenario. So okay, so you have a cabin in Big Bear? I have a cabin in Big Bear. You only go maybe. I, I, I live in the cabin. No, you live somewhere. You live is it my primary resident or second home? Second home. Okay, yeah. we got a second home. You, you go up there in the winter to go snowboarding, whatever. So maybe you rent it out during the summertime or the rest of the year. Can that qualify as an investment property? Or... Mm -hmm. So in that sentence, go ahead. Yeah, does it have to be two years straight of renting, or can you rent out for a specific season and that still qualifies? We're gonna clarify all of that very quickly right now. And I'm gonna tell I'm gonna throw the term at you guys right away. You guys know what's Airbnb? Yeah. God, that's what you're thinking. We're yeah. gonna get deep right now. Okay. Very quick. Okay. We're gonna separate all of that and make it crystal clear. Okay. Also, for the personal use property, is that let's say you have an office building in that's your office? Is that personal use or good question, right? Can I live in a commercial oh, technically, right? Yes, the answer is yes. But can I live in a commercial building where I have my office space? Is that habitable place to live? Technically, no. The answer is no. Of course, many people live in the office yeah. building, right? But office building is not residential. Yeah. It's commercial. And to be more detailed, every zoning has its own zoning number. Commercial, C1, C2, C3, C4. So, Mixed use, MC, MC, sometimes CM, CM, CM1, 2. Mm -hmm. Industrial, remember industrial? Yeah, yeah. M1, M2, M3. Mm -hmm. Residential, R1, R2, R3, R4. So right. for the first one, it has to be residential property. It could be like, let's say you're a dentist and you have like a dentist's office. Is that technically personal use or it has to be residential? It has to be residential. And it can be commercial. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 100%. Do the third one. Uh, vacation home, not exchange because it is for personal use and not for investment. Tell me what's a vacation home. Um, Didn't you give me that, that yeah, example? Yeah. The, the give me the example. Um, so you, you live in LA and you have a cabin in Big Bear and you go up there and snowboard in the winter. Get it? Vacation home in the back. Can I do a 10 to exchange on a vacation home? No, right? Got it? Now we're going to go deep right now, okay? okay? Vacation home. It's your home. It, it, are you generating income? Right? What did I put in there? We have to separate what's Airbnb and what's primary home. What to separate was Airbnb and what's a second home. All of this do not qualify. Okay, Kevin asked me the question. What is Kevin asking? Hi, Kevin. What is Kevin saying? Um, he said it needs to be rented most of the year. Uh, the IRC establishes how much time you can. If it is rented out most of the year, and you can block out dates for personal use. Mm -hmm. Kevin is, is he? You know, when you take a test, there's a bonus test. Yeah. It's a bonus point. Can you read it one more time? What sure, he said? Sure. He's right, by the way. And we're gonna. That's another slide on that, but he's right. It needs to be rented most of the year. The IRC establishes how much time you can, if it's rented out most of the year, you can block out dates for personal use. Can you send a, a happy face mm -hmm. with a plus, please? Because he's right, he's correct, and and I'm, I'm gonna go deeper on that. Okay, we're gonna separate. He's right. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Do the next one. Sure. Selling a business opportunity, including equipment, inventory, and 
What is a selling opportunity? Sell the business opportunity. What is it? Anybody? Maybe something that has like assets as opposed to just like property, like there's equipment, inventory, that sort of thing. Give me, give me a selling, a business opportunity. I'm gonna give you a hand right now. Anybody, uh, go ahead. Would it be like selling the business, including like the building, everything except for the land? You're getting close, but you're right about uh, selling. You're gonna be selling the business. It has nothing to do with real estate. This is business, right? Anybody, uh, you guys got a haircut in the past year? Haircut? Who cuts your hair? So Sophie. So Sophie, the hairstylist, right? What's what's her profession? She's a hairstylist. And she works where? At the special fringe. And what 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 kind of place is it? It's a hair salon. So the pictures in the salon. Go ahead. Pictures along with building. Hair salon. The scissors, the chair, right? All of that, that's business opportunity. Hair salon. Give me another business opportunity. When you guys go and, and buy your food? Restaurant. Hmm? Restaurant. Restaurant. What else? Grocery store. Grocery store. Give me another business opportunity. A gym. A gym. Another one. Dentist. Dentist. You go to a dental office. What else? Sailboat rental. Huh? Sailboat rental. Sailboat rental, yeah. So, selling silver. Got it right. What do we go up, get our little wine, some vodka? Um, what do I have to go to get that? Bar? What else? Yeah, you're right. Bar is a business of pretending. Huh? Winery? That's right. Liquor store, right? Right? Okay. Let's run to business opportunity. Give me one. Personal. Personal. What else? Sailboat rental. Sailboat rental. Car wash. Car wash. Laundry mat. Laundry mat. Anybody else? A mechanic shop. Mechanic shop. Got it? Right? So those are business opportunities. Is that real estate? No. Got it. You have to separate those two. And the reason why I tell you this is because I have 25% of my business. I represent clients who are the business owner who own the building in the business. I am that person. Do I own the building where I'm at, my offices? Yeah. Do I own a brokerage company? Is that a business opportunity? Do I have desk? You see my picture? Do I have chairs in my building? So we have to separate all that, right? Real estate, the building, right? Business opportunity is the actual brokerage company, liquor store. Dental office, right? And then the equipment, right? The equipment, the chairs, table. Go ahead. I feel like same time, like how would that work with this electric facility? Because their building is kind of their business. Good question. The everybody said her storage facility, right? Storage facility. What type of real estate is that? Which sector? Industrial. Rental. That's right. So it's under the sector of industrial. So far, so good, right? So we're selling that storage facility. Are we selling chairs? But like, what if you sold like the company that owns the storage facility? Well, you said right now to get super technical, and that's what I do, right? Yeah. That's what I do. You have to separate. When you're selling the real estate, you separate that business opportunity. The owner of that storage facility, you do another contract to sell the business opportunity. You do another contract to sell the real estate. You have to separate it. Got it? And then also you separate the, the actual equipment, right? Right. Inventory, what's inventory? Give me an example of inventory. In a market, what's inventory in a market? The product that they sell. That's right. Cheese, hot dog, the bread, right? In a liquor store, what's the inventory in the liquor store? Wine, the booze, right? Water, right? How about in, in a hair salon? Huh? That's right. How about in the dental office? 
<laughs> you're right. There's teeth, eh? Yeah, they're the, the artificial ones, right? What else? X ray machine. You got it. X ray machine, the sensor, you know, the scanner, you know, the computer, all that, right? How about Goodwill? I had a question. How yeah. do you separate inventory from claimant, for example, the, the dentist? That's right. But like a, a scanner, is that considered equipment or inventory? Or like a, like a, would they use a washer? Now? Everything is going to be connected. Everything you said right now, connected directly to depreciation. Got it? You're going to depreciate an asset, right? You buy the scanner. You spend 20 grand, right? You're going to depreciate, right? But does that fall under equipment? Because do people depreciate inventory or just equipment? What do you think? Just equipment. So inventory will be a list of items. And by the way, just to let you know, this is where wealth management, anybody in accounting, those of you who want to represent clients, you know, you have to know this to itemize. Who's in accounting? Accounting major? What, right? So basically, you have to when you separate it, can you depreciate inventory? Can you depreciate equipment? Generally speaking, when you're going to be depreciating assets, going to be, are you going to be depreciating something that costs you like $5, $10? $10? There has to be a, an amount, right? Let's say five grand. I usually go, most of the time when I depreciate, it's more than 8,000, by the way. If it's like three, four $4,000, I just claim it in the end for that year's expense. But if it's like a big expense, you know you can depreciate, but this is this is not real estate, right? How about goodwill? Anybody knows what goodwill? Yeah. It's an intangible asset. Ooh, that were so good. <laughs> that were so good. Intangible asset, guys. Continue. It's like reputation surrounding the company. Exactly right. I know that A plus. <laughs> you got it. It's exactly right. Goodwill is intangible. What does intangible means? It's not like a physical thing that you can like touch. It's like uh, not tangible. What What is the opposite of touch? You cannot touch, <laughs> right? In, can you touch in an uh, intangible asset? You can't value it. It's it's like a patent kind of. I guess a patent is another. Yeah, beautiful that you are exactly correct things that you cannot touch think about a business that you cannot touch in a business right what can you you cannot touch in a business you said it what trademark got it trademark that's one what else Patent. patents copyright copyright goodwill right all of that my name, Edgar Asensio, my brand, your brand, right? Do you realize that you have goodwill, your brand? This is why you have to live. I know this is a real estate class, but at the same time, we have to be good people with morals, ethics. You have a reputation to build. I've been in the industry for a long time. I'm proud of my last name, my name. You know, I'm solid, you know? I treat people right, you know? They come to me and we've been in customers for all these years. I have a brand. You guys are, right now, your name is the brand. You have a brand right now, your reputation. Got it? Can you touch your reputation? What do you call when you don't touch something? Intangible. Is that called? Goodwill. Got it? Question. Can I do a 1031 exchange on Goodwill? The answer is no. Right in the back? No, right? You cannot. Right? Crystal clear. You cannot. Can I do a tinted run exchange on my inventory? No, right? We already established that, right? All these things you cannot do, right? You can. No. Last but not least, <laughs> by the way, this is where you're going to separate investors with. I heard that word about one of these. Let's call it. Uh, people who are in the industry just passing by. 
you are not one of those. Okay, you are someone who is going to follow the rules and know your strategies as far as the real estate investment. Okay, so Bella, what's number five? Flipping properties. And nothing wrong with this, by the way. Not to interrupt, Bella. There's nothing wrong with this. Everybody has their own way of doing things. But right now, we're learning about 1031 exchange, right? We're learning about wealth creation. Remember the class is called 1031 wealth? We're going to create wealth. I have my three units, four units. I want to buy 10 units, right? That's what we're doing right now. Continue. Flipping property not intended to rent. Property was not rented out. Simple as that, right? I bought a building today in six months. I fixed it up. Now I'm going to sell in seven months. Can I do that? Can I do a 1031 exchange on that one? No. No, you cannot flip properties. Crystal clear? Okay. So this is a transaction that I just did. And uh, we're gonna go through this transaction real quick. So you can see just an example of transaction that I do, okay? Okay. Let's go a couple of more minutes and then we'll take another break. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Selling a property wishes that a family has owned for five years. Four units, your interest property, I sold it for 1.5. Okay. We're gonna take polling question. That's a cliffhanger right now. So we're gonna continue with that case, okay? But we're gonna do a recap real quick. Online, ready? Do the honors. Can you read the first one? Me? Yeah, please. Okay. Thank you. If you acquire a property via quick claim deed, how long must you own the property before you can sell to do a 1031 exchange to purchase a replacement property? Mom, dad, grandma, somebody, they quickly, quickly mean that they, they gave you a property, you know, like a gift, right? Quick claim, right? So how long you must own the property before you can do a 1031 exchange, right? So they, they gave you that property. So do you wait six, six months, one year, two years, three years? Anybody? Who says you don't have to wait? You don't have to wait? Online, what's the answer from Kevin? Two, two, two years. years, Kevin says two years. Who says six months? One year? Okay. Who's with Kevin? Oh, most of you are with Kevin. You have a chance. Okay. So how about three years? Connected to what you're saying. Just always keep that in mind. Just make it simple. By the way, this industry is simple. We just let's just learn something that has been we have been doing this for the past like 80, 90 years. Then let's don't reinvent the wheel. But there's always a time period. Keep keep in mind it's two years. Because it's always keep in mind this any law students. Anyways, uh if any, any law students you're gonna connect to this word intent. If the intent was to do a 1031 exchange or not, right? So that's why the IRS always wants you to wait at least two years, okay? 24 months. So that's the answer. Okay. Okay, do the honors. The next question, please. Yeah. Can an Airbnb be used, can an Airbnb be used as a lifetime property to exchange into? What does that question mean? Anybody? We talked about it before. Maybe lifetime. Lifetime is the value, right? Go ahead. Like, can you buy a home that would normally be thought of as a second home or vacation home, but if you rent it out, like, what other implications apply? Both of you, which about 10 minutes ago, we're talking about this right now, to separate, right? Airbnb, right? Or he has a home like in Vegas, or excuse me, was uh, some uh, New York or, or Big Bear, right? So, and then you rent it out, right? So you have to separate. 
you have to know what's personal and what's income, right? So now we're gonna separate, right? So Airbnb is is Airbnb personal? I don't want to say that's a trick question, but I'm just going to give you the answer, okay? Technically, Airbnb, right, is a business. It's an investment. People buy Airbnb just to rent it out. They buy homes. They buy condos, duplexes, right? Because there's a lot of, it's a new trend, right? I shouldn't say new in the past five years, right? Like you got more demand that you buy Airbnb just to rent it out, right? Little rooms, right? You can, instead of making 5,000 for a house, just rent each room for like four or $500 in each room and you can make double that, right? That is nothing wrong with that. So going back to the, the question, right? Can an Airbnb be used for like and property to exchange? Airbnb was, we said that it's an investment, right? Do the owners, can you read the answer to that question? Yeah. Yes, as long as you document that in your tax return and show the income that it's rented well. Got it? So that's the, the simple, super simple, right? Super Airbnb is an investment, right? To sell it, to rent, excuse me, rent it to your friends, your parents, your family members, <clears throat> to the public, who cares? As long as they give you income, right? You know, just as an investment, right? Airbnb rental is an investment. Crystal clear, right? Got it? Okay. Okay, you're in the back. Yeah, you. In the white chair. <clears throat> What's your name? Press. Press? Press. Press. Please to meet you. Mm -hmm. Can you do the honor on a read that one if you don't mind? Yeah. Yes. What am I asking? Yes. No problem. It's okay. Airbnb, we already established it's an investment, right? Yes. Crystal clear. Got it? Are we talking about Airbnb for personal profit, personal use? No, right? We already established that. It's a hundred percent, right? Established. Is Airbnb personal? Is it an investment? Airbnb is an investment, right? A hundred percent, crystal clear, right? If you don't understand that one, you cannot answer this question. By the way, you have to you have to clarify that a hundred percent. Isn't it justified by the amount of time you use it per year? Did you hear what you said? We have another star for you as well. You're right. She's 100% correct. And that's going to be follow. It's going to follow up this question. But she's right what you said. But we cannot answer this question until we know what type of investments is at Airbnb. I ask you one more time. Is Airbnb for personal use? Airbnb is an investment. Got it? Crystal clear, right? So you would you would view Airbnb Airbnb the same as you would a standard rental. The same would apply, correct? Did everybody hear what you said in the back? Did you hear what you said? Say it one more time. You would apply the same theory uh, for Airbnb and rental. Uh, this the same the same the same uh, depending on the percentage that you would use it per year, uh, through the year. Yeah. Remember we talked about all those properties, all the sectors in commercial, retail, multifamily, office space, industrial, right? Mixed use. Keep in mind that Airbnb is one of those. Put in your mind, right? We're not talking about nothing personal. Got it? It's an investment, right? It's the IRS. There's the question of how much money you're making from it. That's right. Just, just report it. That was the previous question, right? To report it, right? We have to get, we cannot answer this question until that's clear, right? Got it? Okay. So now, 
Does the IRS allow you to use your Airbnb for personal use? I think that someone was asking, was making that call. I don't know if it was you or somebody in the back, but can I use an Airbnb for personal use? Is Airbnb an investment? Yes. Crystal clear, right? You see this question? If you don't have, if you cannot answer that, you cannot answer this one. Got it? Okay. Who says yes? Raise your hand. Who says no? Okay, online. Can I use, remember, we already bought it, but we bought the investment, right? So I can rent it to, I put my ad in uh, Craigslist on uh, Trulia, Zillow, get all this, I'm gonna rent all these rooms. I'm gonna say yes, because I think it depends on the percentage of the fees. That's correct, you get in there right now. Ready? Wait a minute. Can they be right? I said that Airbnb is an investment, right? But right now, is the answer is telling me I can use it for a person. So which one is it? Remember what Bella said, what she said? We're gonna clarify it right now, okay? Does the federal government of the U.S. allow 14 days a year for personal use? Let's connect, let's connect the dots now. Okay, do the honors if you don't mind. Yeah, please, let's digest it. Okay, yes, the time period of a minimum of either 14 days a year or 10% of the time that is rented, if the property is rented for less than 140 days a year, you still get 14 personal days. Who can connect the dots right now? Interpretation days. Anybody? So Airbnb, is it an investment? Yes. Can I use my investment for personal use? Yes. How many days, days can I use for personal use? 10%. How many days? 14 days. 14 days, or 10%, whichever is greater, right? So once again, Airbnb, is it an investment? Yes. Can I use it for personal use? Yes. For how many days? 14 days. Get it? Or 10%, whatever you want. Or 10%, exactly right. Got it. Let's say you were interested in wanting to launch an Airbnb business. Okay, let's let's do it. This mm -hmm. that scenario is the perfect scenario, oh. just by by your statement. Right now, all of us, oh, we're gonna be the investor right now, right? We're buying this investment for Airbnb only, right? Continue. And so, if you wanted to um, start your own Airbnb business, got it. Um, what did you buy? I bought a. A two bedroom, two bath condo. Got it. So we got a condo for Airbnb, two bedroom. I'm still with you. We're still with you. Oh, okay. Um, You're right. Perfect. Continue. And so I guess I just want to know like how. No, continue. You, you build a strategy as you talking. <laughs> yes. So, so we so we have that the condo, right? Two bedroom condo. Yes. Continue. So we're gonna rent the rooms. Yes. Maybe I'm gonna rent the, the, the living room. I'm gonna I'm gonna milk that baby, like they say, right? I'm gonna milk that investment. That's why you're in Airbnb. So you live in a room and then you're renting out your Airbnb the living room. This is the scenario. Yeah. No, not yet. Okay. You're, you're not living there. Okay. It's an investment, so 100% investment, okay. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're renting, let's milk it, right? I'm, I'm, how many bedrooms do I have? Two bedrooms. Two bedrooms, right? I'm, I'm renting one room. I can even cut that room in half, right? Let's do a couple. Okay. And then another room, I rent it again, right? right? When I rent the living room. Let's make it simple. We're renting two rooms. Okay. Continue. 
Oh, you're renting two rooms. Um, you decorate it, you furnish it, uh, you, you put it up on the website. Um, you rent it maybe for, I mean, let's just say it's a, a condo in Miami. Um, and it's about, it's a pretty expensive place. It's on a high rise. Yeah. So, you know, probably let's say uh, maybe $275 a night. Uh, you list it. Uh, you found uh, a couple that's maybe vacationing for like a bachelor or bachelor party. Fantastic. So yeah. far, the investment is excellent, right? Yes. Continue. Um, then you rent the space, and I guess you just want to know how do you properly um, organize everything so then you're not spending so much on upkeep of the uh, condo when you're renting it out to strangers. And by the way, that this is where you separate people who wants to be in that type of investment who does not or does. Meaning that Airbnb, once you put in the platform, right? You have to pay cleaning fees, deposits, and so far, right? But it's very lucrative, you know? If you have the time and the management skills, go ahead and do that. Because you're gonna have a turnover every day or every Weak, right? So you, if you have systems in place, do it, right? Oh, you know, my tenant, uh, we moved down in five days, but I have another one coming in the next morning. So make sure you have your systems in place so you have a crew, come see or yourself to go clean it, have it ready for the next one or the next one. Yes. Just a question about um, minimum. Yes. Can you read it, please? Yeah. Um, so George said, so in the Airbnb example, you can only live in it for 14 days of personal use. Okay, so George is asking online. Let's answer George's question. What's the question again? So in the Airbnb example, you could only live in it for 14 days of personal use? Yes. Everybody says yes? No? Yes? Yes. Yes? In the back, why? You're right. The answer is yes. You're right. Why? It's the rule. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Okay. Can you answer? Sorry. Yes, 14 days. Oh, you did already? Oh. Uh, well, oh. Yeah, they can hear us though. Just in case. <laughs> so, thank you. Wait, was the question is, is 14 days the maximum? What was the question? You're right, but remember the, what it's it, just based on the rented time. Ten percent, yeah. So let's say you rent it for two hundred days in a year. That's twenty days. Of you, do you see right now? I don't want to say loophole. A way to increase or decrease the fourteen days. Yeah, yeah. If you you, you're, you're thinking correctly. Yeah. Go ahead. Is, is the personal use? Ten percent for ten percent. Vegan, uh, vegan minimum because uh, in the example, the first one of 140 days will be 10% personal use for vegan. But the second point says that we can use it for 14 personal days. So, is it possible that to increase the rental days, for example, instead of 140, maybe 200? Is it possible you keep it the same 14 days personal use? Yes. Yes. This is an is Airbnb an investment or personal? We established that, right? Investment, investment. The scenario is the perfect scenario that your classmates, your colleagues here said, right? I have a place in the, in Vegas, in New York, or in a cabin, right? You know, I don't live there. It's not a primary <coughs> essence. It's not a second home, right? It's my investment, right? I didn't buy that property to go live in it. Who like who's no you say snowboarding? Who says snowboarding? Yeah. So you know, one day, one weekend with my buddies, I want to go and snowboard. Right? Am I allowed to do that? It's an investment. Can I do that? Up to how many days? <clears throat> Got it? You see the scenario? Got it? So, so you can break it up seven days here or seven days there. You can you can do 14 weekends. You, you're correct. Or like Saturday and Sunday, right? Because 
is an investment, but you can legally use it for your personal use. Get it? Yeah. What if you just say for half of the year the property was rented out for Airbnb, the other half was vacant? Can't you just show up any day of the week during that other half where it's vacant? Just not tell them that I was there. Yes. <laughs> remember. <laughs> The, the answer to the question, one hundred percent yes. But remember that we are here because we are good reputation, good people, and follow the rules. And the IRS, the IRS, making sure that your taxes are on time. You you report your income the right way, correct? But is it like it's not wrong? I guess it's just making you show up. Because the IRS isn't like monitoring you every week. Are you there? Are you there? The IRS only knows that you tell them. Yeah, so it's not like unethical to just be there for half. I, I want to tell you what I apply in my uh, life and yeah. my reputation, and most important, who I am as a person. Plus, I have my license, broker's license, and I have my officer license. I represent clients. Get it? It's not worth it to do to think like that. Trust me, when I wake up in the morning, I'm ready to go to work. I'm not thinking about, oh my God, somebody's IRS gonna find out I did that. You follow me, don't, I don't recommend, please. Take it from experience. I've been in the same place. I'm very ultra conservative. When I make decisions, it's not 99, it's 100. If I'm not 100, I don't make that decision. Get it? So it's not worth to think like that. You know? So think always follow straight line. Yes. Is a timeshare similar situation as that for multiple owners? Or is that similar? Oh my God, you guys are getting smart now. <laughs> Everybody heard what you said right now? Timeshare. Who's a what is a timeshare? I know you you know what it is. What's a timeshare? Okay, enlighten us. What is a timeshare? Um, it's a property with multiple owners that use it at different times of the year. That's right. Are you buying the real estate? I don't, yeah. No, I don't know. Oh, vacation. Hold that thought for a moment. Okay. Let's, let's do a little bit uh footnote. Can somebody tell me what is the stock? When you purchase the share, <clears throat> anybody? They pretty much a small part portion of equity. Do you hear what he said? What he said? What 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 are you saying? Small <clears throat> Got it. In the company, right? I got it. We're gonna go deep now, okay? Have you guys heard about REITs? Real Estate Investment Trust. You can buy shares on the 200 building. Who lives in a, like a 100, 200 unit building? Okay, that building, right? There's a high possibility it's part of an REIT, a REIT, or a syndication, like a group of, of, of investors, right? If it's an REIT, you, you and you, you can go, or he's $5,000, I want to buy a chair in that building, right? Or time chair, go to Cancun, right? They're always selling, man, Puerto Vallarta is notorious for selling chairs. The room that you're gonna be renting, I'll assure you that in 24 hours, a sales lady is gonna, a person's gonna tell you, buy a chair so you can come here like maybe three times a year, one weekend, two weekends, right? Buy a chair, that's, that's, that's where your mind was, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that you're buying the real estate, right? So that's an asset. It has value, but it's a different type of asset. Okay. Right. So, so the answer is no. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Crystal clear, everybody. Okay. Really awesome. Do the honors of that question. Does the you government allow ten percent of the time that is rented for personal use? Mm -hmm. Did you see? I asked. I asked that question in reverse. In the back, you, yeah, no, behind you, all the way, yeah, you, no, you, yeah, you, what's your name? Huh? Right, nice to meet you, honey. Read the question, please. 
Can you tell me what I'm asking? Go on with the IRS, okay? The IRS, a lot, 10% of that, that is rented for personal use. So I bought an investment, right? Airbnb is an investment, right? But I wanna go on the weekend to go snowboarding. I wanna go with my friend on the, maybe a week. Can, can the IRS allow me to do that? Can I do it? Huh? Yes. Got it? Everybody? Yes? Okay, read the answer, please. Yeah, you rented to more than a third day to go to the For the reason you're sitting here, how do you get 100% of the interest? Therefore, you will get 30 personal days. 30 days. Is that the other one? That's the other day. You put it on 30 days. By the way, you just reminded me of me a few weeks ago that I had to do a presentation and I had to present something and I had to read something. <laughs> I couldn't read in detail. Anyways, uh, it's I understand that you couldn't read. It. <laughs> Did we find a loophole? Do we find a way that we can increase the 14 days? Huh? Not really, because you said it was based on the 10% of like how many, like the total amount of time that you rent the property for. Okay, so enlighten us. Tell us. You're right. Everything you're saying, you're correct. I mean, it's just you just exceeded, you just you just spread the time out more to 365, and I mean, or not 200 days, and that's where you got your 20 days from. So if it's 300 days, it's 30 days. You're correct. Right? So. That's right. <laughs> so do you see how you can decrease or increase? But the rule is 14 days, right? But then this is one way they yeah. can do a little bit more. <laughs> Got it? Crystal clear on that one? Everybody? Okay. Bella, question? Can you ask a question? I have a question. Yeah, this one. Can you read it? Oh, wait, yeah. Do you have to show that Airbnb is not a personal property or second home or vacation home? See, yes. By the way, if you got, if you understood this question and know the answer, I know that you really got it. 100% or like 99, okay? And then we'll take a break. Can you read the question? Do you have to show that the Airbnb is not a personal property, second home, or vacation home? Got it? Read that question one more time, please. Do you have to show that the Airbnb is not a personal property, second, second home, or a vacation home? You have to show it, right? Do you have to? Yes, you have to show the government, IRS, that it's not your personal resident, a second home, but a rental. So we're going to separate, right? Because people think that the Airbnb is for personal use, right? It's a misconception in the market. It is not. It's an investment, right? People think that it's personal property. People may think that it's a vacation home or a second home. That's why I listed these three. Remember, the list of properties are not eligible. For 1031 exchange, right? So that's why I listed it. So it's a rental. So let's take a five minute break and we'll, the rest of the 30 minutes, and then we'll conclude. And then if you have questions, come and see me. But let's take a five minute break. Is that okay? All right, thank you.
You know, sometimes when you're supposed to be shifting, you move it in direction, you would get older and then like kind of the left, so instead of going right, it's really How about you? How do you Did I tell you what happened to me in the past two years? Or you don't know. Actually, I made an announcement to some of our students. I got a second to the doctor for me. It was Well, it took me four months, but you know, I mean, the process is a process. So today we have two classes. So before teaching her, I made two classes. What was it the class? Uh, no, no, the teaching on the front yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's intensive, but it's good. You have to read and, and then work in 10, 12 hours of the office in the, in the night. Study. And like, that's the story of my life. Like, we have a stack of stuff that they go through. I'm like, I have so much hands on the work I have to do that my brain is like, it's dirty. It's like, like shaking my head in a slow, slow way. Because <laughs> I have to calm down. Yeah. I'm not calm. Um, <laughs> so super hyper. For me to do that, I have to dedicate an entire day Sorry. to mentally be ready to like breathe on it. Yeah. It's it's totally different. You're still one? Yeah. 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 But my um cousin is looking to uh right. and so I just talked to her about maybe like investing in some duplexes. Yeah. I think it's the best thing for both of us. I need multi parking, multi unit, and she needs to be local. You know what happened on Wednesday, right? I made the announcement last Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's, oh, yeah, I'm glad you're watching. Three, three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. After, big. after three years. Huge. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's, they had you, though. They had to. I, I don't see how that controls inflation, but okay. <laughs> Yeah, there's going to be more coming. Which is good. I think it's going to put people in a different position for sure. Yeah. Okay. I keep looking for my, my brother. I lost my hand. It was in the top of the thing. I need something about the program for you. That's awesome. It's going to feel good. It's excellent. Okay, we're back. We ready? Okay, so we're gonna go on this side of the room now. What's the question? Can you? Oh, the next one. Do the honors, please. Is that a requirement? Do you you buy an Airbnb, right? Do you have to rent it for a whole year? Oh. Is it mandatory? It's an investment. Is it mandatory? No. Why? 
Can you read it, please? No, five properties and we'll see more properties and two in the and the eight rentals as well as those properties. We're talking about that, right? You can buy a cabin. In, remember that one that I sold in Chris Line? It's a it's an investment. It can be a seasonal. It's a seasonal, seasonal property, right? So you continue. So when you are when you enter into a 1031 exchange, you hire an accommodator to hold the funds. Do you remember who was the accommodator? Anybody? Follow me, right? Mm -hmm. Relinquish property, you sell. What do you call the one that you buy? Relinquish property, replacement property. Relinquish property, replacement property. So relinquish property, you sold it today. How many? How much time do I need to buy that replacement property? Buy it? Yep. 180 days. You got it, right? You're here. Relinquish property, replacement property. How much time do I have? Right. So how much time do I have to identify a property? Right. Day one, relinquish, 45 days to identify, and then you have 135 left to complete 180 days. Got it, everybody? Okay. And I'll give you the hint. Question, right, at the end of the class, but you should know the answer by now. So we have how many days to identify the property? Huh? 45. 45? Got it. How many rules there are to identify the property? Yes? Three. There are three rules, right? Remember? To identify the property, right? Three rules. <clears throat> what are the three rules? Give me one rule. Anybody? 95% rules. 95% rules. Got it? Give me another rule. Three property rules. Three property rule. And give me the third last. 200%. 200 rule. 200% rule. Yeah, we're going to say 200. Yeah. Crystal clear, right, guys? Okay. So we have three rules. I'm going to go in here in the back. Anybody? Name the three rules to identify property. Which are the three rules? From here to the back. Yeah. 200% rule, you are correct. Three property rule, you are correct. Three property rule, you are correct. 95% rule. Oh, we're going to say that. 95% rule. Crystal clear, right? So we have three rules for right now to identify the property. All right. So now, the most important piece of the puzzle, right? Day one, 45 days, 135 days more, 160, right? The one that you sell is called relinquished property. The one that you buy is called replacement, replacement property. Everybody with me, right? So imagine you're here, somebody's here in the middle. There's a middle person here, third party. Third party is neutral. Third party has no connection with nobody at all. Get it? This person, entity, has no connection with all these parties. Got it? That entity is called an accommodator. Got it? The accommodator is the one who's going to get the money from that sale, that relinquished property. You sold it for $1 million. Comes here to the accommodator, and then you find a replacement property or a fine for them up to 180 days, right? Then the accommodator is going to send the money to escrow to buy it. Everybody with me? So far, so good, right? Question The seller of the relinquished property. Who's going to buy the replacement property using the accommodator? Is that seller 
going to be touching the money? In the back? Yes or no? I want to say it one more time, right? You are selling that relinquished property, right? You sold four units, 10 unit profit, right? Then you found a replacement property to purchase. But when you sold that relinquished property, you give the money to the accommodator, and then you find a replacement property, replacement property, they need the money, right, to buy this property, right? So the accommodator is going to send it to escrow here. So with me, that's an area, right? From here to here to here. Question. That seller of the Rico's property, is he touching that money or she? Is, is that seller touching money? Yes. Under this scenario? No. Yes. So who says yes? Who says no? You're correct. In the back. Who says no? Why? No, that's right. You what did why you don't touch the money under that scenario? Yeah. You got it. I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, I guess I'm just No, no, it's okay. It's okay. The, the, the money goes from A to B and it stays there it until is. C is ready. That's right. That's why okay. we just do it. I, I like, I like I you. misunderstood. No, but I, I like what you, the way that you're thinking. You're thinking correctly, by it's the like, way. The, the like money the, gets stronger. It's like the trustee or like somebody. Remember, let's try to make things. You're thinking correctly, by the way. Make it simple. These are simple. Relinquish. Replacement. What do you call the person in the middle? The accommodator. The accommodator. The seller is not involved at all. He's not touching no money. What happens if he touches the money? What happens? What was the word that with the B? Good. You touch that money, you pay taxes. Got it? Still with me? I know. Into the property, the money gets transferred to from A, like you said, B, right? Here, come with the A, and then you find every person property from B to C. I like the way you're thinking, right? Yeah. Are there certain companies that do like accommodating, like specialize in accommodating? Or like who does the accommodating? Now we're talking, now we're. Now, now we're talking about connecting academia with practice, with career. Mm -hmm. Got it? What he said right now is a career. You make tons of money becoming an accommodator. One, two, three, four, five percent. Can you get it? Um, Got it? Got it? Just you can, an accommodator is like an accountant or a CPA or a bank, or a, a financial institution, or an insurance company. You can be that. You go get your license, get a bond, and then you're an accommodate. You're, and you can, you can represent, because you have a good reputation, you can represent hundreds of clients all over the US, let's say California, with the software. But just escrow act as an accommodator somewhat as well, because they do hold on to the money for a minute to put it in. Do you remember what I said about accommodator? That's why you're gonna separate the accommodator with the escrow. Escrow does the paperwork, it's a third party to do paperwork. But the accommodator is the person who holds the actual money coming in. So you have to have a strong bond. You have to be somebody reputable, somebody who has good reputation, somebody who's has a license, has a bond, who's straight, who is trustworthy, right? Because you're giving that person millions of dollars. Should say million, it can be a hundred, two hundred thousand. It's all relative, right? But you give him money, right? Yes. I just have a question regarding um, <clears throat> I heard like certain people were trying to get it um, abolished, I guess. Like, was there a consensus in that? Like, 
Now we'll, we'll get to that area right now. We'll get on the political part. Yeah. Right now, <laughs> one of those parties, they, one supports it, one doesn't, right? Well, have you heard the word unrealized capital gains? Okay, who can tell me what is capital gains? So you buy a stock, it's pretty much however much it goes up, that's capital. Profit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Make it simple, right? You're right. Right? Mm -hmm. Got it? Remember we talked about capital gains? Remember we have four taxes, 62%. One of them was capital gains tax, remember? Still with me, right? Unrealized capital gains is unrealized means that you haven't sell, you haven't sold anything yet. So that's the proposal that you're talking about. Just, just not to get on the political side, just being neutral. Yeah. But that's what you're talking about, right? If there's a profit the next year on, on your property, that's the proposal. You want, they want you to pay capital gains on that unrealized capital gains. Pay taxes on that unrealized capital gains. Okay. Get it? It's, 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 it's wow. on a personal level, on a professional level. And representing investors more than 50, been an investor for a long time. Okay, you think it's up, big, or down? Horrible. It's horrible, right? Anyway, so of course, because you haven't even, I haven't even gone through the process for 180 days, right? 145, 80. I haven't even engaged in that process, put that in the trash, and just start charging. That's what you're talking about. So I'm, I'm a guessing, yeah, no, no, I'm very much coming in. Yeah. Anyways, let's continue. So this is how you're gonna empower the, the, uh, the accommodator. You sign the agreement. Once you sign the agreement, then the accommodator becomes you as a seller, okay? That's the agreement here. These are the benefits that I told you about. So the next side, let's spend, let's see if we can spend like 10 minutes or so this is uh, on the financial part, numbers, and uh, I'm gonna take it from here as far as on a macro level, because we can quantify spend time. I love doing this. This is this is who I am, but the class is more about you understanding the context, the concept, okay? And stop me if I lose you, okay? Seven benefits to do it, okay? To engage in this process, right? One day, 45 days to identify, 125 days more, 160, 100, how many days do I need to complete the transaction? 180. Huh? 180. That's right, 180, right? Okay. So, think about this for a moment, guys. I bought the building, right? It's making money. Why do I need to go through all this? steps. I'm going to keep it forever. Well, for what? Right? Nothing wrong with that. Really. I'm pretty sure. Who, who's uh, families in real estate? You? Your mom? Who do you? Have you heard that some investors do not sell the property? They keep it, right? Why would you keep it? Because there's no need. It's making money, right? So now I quantify why Somebody should do it. Got it? Remember the class is wealth creation, right? Real estate 1031 wealth wanna create wealth. How do we create wealth? You wanna sell one and buy the replacement property and then increase the fair market value. And so you're gonna be creating wealth. It's guaranteed. It's quantifiable. I confirm the seven benefits. Okay. Okay, let's go in the back. If you can read the first one. Uh, yeah, you, black shirt. Yeah, what's the first benefit? Huh? What does that mean? Give me an example, make it simple. I'm, I'm in South East LA, I have my apartment building, yes. Gonna go to Hollywood. Simple as that, right? 
we can quantify that. That's one reason, right? Next to you, the blue shirt. What's your name? Hong? Hong. Hong. Pleased to meet you. Can you read the second benefit, please? What does that mean? What's new we're building in the context of the benefits? An example, right? So you have a building, was built in 1920s. Yes. You don't have to like, you don't have to, um, what do you call it? Like, uh, you're gonna have to fix a lot of things. You got it. Yeah. What happened with older buildings? Yeah. Defer maintenance, so right? All that. And by the way, once again, if you see an opportunity of our property was built in the First World War One, in the 1800, it's old. Different maintenance, buy it. You have the opportunity, you just want that real estate asset. Eventually, you're gonna start graduating to better, better asset. Get it? So that's that's what we're talking about. Better uh, newer building. So you sold a property from the 1920s and you buy one from 1930. You buy one property from 19, was built, built. I'm talking about the day it was built, constructed, 1970. Now you're gonna buy something 2000. Then generally speaking, the newer the building, the more expensive, right? So don't worry about buying something that is old. Just get the property, buy it, okay? Got it? Understand that one? All right. Read the next one, please, if you don't mind. Huh? Four units. Continue? Five, seven units. Explain that to me. Right? I have a fourplex. I'm making 5000 a month. Now I have seven units, a fourplex, and a triplex. I'm making 10 grand now. So it's working, right? To do it. Okay, next one. Why should? What's your name? Huh? What does that mean? Yes, different type of unit, right? So you have an apartment building, they're all one bedrooms. You know what? Every two years, somebody's moving out. That couple that got married, or they need a house. There's a turn, usually smaller the bedrooms, uh, uh, there's a more turnover, generally speaking. So you go buy, instead of having all one bedroom, you go buy all two bedrooms, or maybe two, three bedrooms and a one bedroom, but you just upgrade to better unit mix. That's what that means. Yeah. Okay, next. You? Yeah. What's your name? For that service, arms, interest only, maintenance, or You're going to go borrow money, right, at the bank. This, the different type of loan that you can get. The more debt you have leverage, you're gonna increase your cash flows. Simple as that. You, you're gonna leverage. Do I care a lot about debt? Yeah, I'm ultra conservative, you know? But when you are at this stage, go ahead and take it. If you, if somebody's gonna give you some money to borrow to buy a building, get it, okay? I, I highly recommend it, okay? Okay, uh, next one, let's go this way, yeah. Yeah. What does that mean? That's that's right. This is connected to like kind. Remember with like kind value? You can buy a property that is more value. And by the way, this are this are paper that I'm reading right now. Uh, it what is the extra amount of wealth that you can have when you do a 1031 exchange when you buy a replacement property? On average, it's over 300000 by the way. So the moment, keep think about for a moment, right? The moment that you do a transaction, it's quantifiable. Your wealth will increase at a minimum 300000 Just by you doing that transaction. 
Get it? Okay, let's continue. Uh, next, yeah. Uh, random events. What does that mean? I think we, I think we be, we begin by talking about number seven. What does that mean? That's right. Are you paying the same rent that you were paying last year? Less or more last year? Less. How about three years ago? Even who said way, way, way less? One of you, right? Yeah. How about 10 years ago? Way, 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 way less, mm -hmm. right? So it's quantifiable. This is the reason why. Got it? Yeah. So number seven yeah. is connected to number three, right? That's right. And so this is, and we're gonna do a poll before we go home real quick to see which one do you approve, right? And this is when you're gonna separate you as an investor, what type of investor you are, right? Mm -hmm. If you are a risk adverse or risk taker, mm -hmm. right? To see where you are. And he's gonna determine which, which one do you like on, on the benefits, you know? Okay, so the rents are keep, keep going up. That's what this slide is all about, you know? And this is the case study with this uh, client of mine. Remember I mentioned to you about this building? Look at the, the profile. Four units in Westchester, just down the street from here, 1.5. They had a loan for 240,000. Cap rate is 4.75. How do you get cap rate, anybody? How do you calculate cap rate? Well, Got it? He's right. NOI divided by value, simple as that, right? That's how you get cap rate. Got it? So when you're comparing, you need to know these numbers, right? Okay. So we sold it for 1.5, 120 sales costs. Sales costs, that's my commission included there, okay? I love this number, isn't it nice? You become a broker, two, three transactions, you make all that money, get it? If you charge 1%, 2, 3, 4, 5, now you can go up to 6 where you're the owner of the company. You have control of that. But that, that's a new rule now that you can go 2.5 and 2.5. And but it's still, if you own your own brokerage company, even if it's 1% or 2%, it's still very good. Okay, okay let's continue. So loan balance was 240. So this family had... 1,186,000 cash ready to go, right? The Lincoln's property, commentator got this money, ready to go buy the replacement, right? We satisfied the one of the rules, the three rules that we talked about. So we got how much money we have to play with? Think about for a moment, right? We have 1.1 that one, we gotta do something with that 1.1. One. We have three units. One of you guys tell me what would you do with that 1.1 million? Let's call it 1.2. Let's make it juicy. It's cash. What are you gonna buy? Here's the profile. Anyway. Go ahead. Uh, I would use it as a down payment for some for maybe like multiple properties because I use the um, three property rule, then, and I paid like 10% down, I would have, but I feel like I could definitely keep it within the value that's, um, the sales value, but also be able to, like, have three properties out of one. You are so right. That's, you have to diversify. You have to, we want to create wealth, right? You're right. I'm not going to buy another one. I'm going to buy more. I got, how much do I have? 1.2, almost, right? So yeah. you can use that as like a down payment or like some type of other- That's right. Real estate adventure. Man, I, think about for a moment, guys. We got 1.1, 1.2, ready to go, right? 45 days, isn't it exciting? But he, me, I get excited because my commission again, you know, but it's exciting to be part of that process with the client, right? Because you're making them happy. There's some people who already, already established, but they, 
they want to create wealth for the family, for you guys, when you guys when you have, when you have kids, want to give it to your kids as well. This is this is a fact, okay? Wealth creation, right here. Look what we did. To your point, we bought four units in Los Alamitos. Down payment, we didn't use the how much do we have? One point one. Uh uh uh. Out of the one point one, I got four eighty. I still have money left, right? Look at my cap rate, better cap rate, right? I got a loan, it's okay, I got more leverage, but loan is your friend, leverage is your friend, no problem. Go ahead. Why didn't you decide to do 40% down payment? Ah, I could have done 50% or I could have done 20. Just make sure you go at least 20 so you don't pay double insurance. But based on the numbers, my break even, it was like 30%, 40% is giving more cash flow. So that's the answer. I still have money left. What, what did we do? This is a fact, by the way. This is a fact of a family that I did this for them, okay? It's a picture, three units. Look at the unit mix. What did we get? We got huge, two, three bedrooms. We got more income coming in because it's a bigger place, got it? And look at my down payment, large down payment, 64%, right? My cap rate was high. Remember my cap rate in the beginning was 4.5? Now it's higher, right? Beautiful, right? Here's the summary. Seven benefits, sort of 1.5. Now we have a property, it's 1.2 and another one 1.4. Here's my debt, okay? Down payment. One I put 480,000, they own seven or six, 40 or 60% down. Get it? Here are the seven benefits. It's a profile from four units. I went to seven. You built 1949, remember? Newer building. I got newer property, 1978, 79. Better location. And which is still nice, but you know, you went to Los Alamitos, a nice area as well. And then look at the, the value of the property. 6160. Your GAI, this is your, your gross income. Your NOI, I was making he was making 73,680. Now look, he's making over 110, 120,000 now. Get it? Look, per market value went up. His wealth increased by 750,000. Isn't it nice? It's beautiful, right? So the cap rate from 4.75 went up to 5.3, 5.4. Mortgage, okay, I have more mortgage, okay. We got more income coming in, right? No problem. Relinquished property, the loan, original was 600,000, okay. This is a calculation for uh, depreciation. Your best friend, do you see right here, this 626? Capital gains. I didn't have to pay this capital gain because I did a 1031 exchange. Six one to five. Look. Look how much, if I didn't do it, how much I, I needed to pay? 296. So I increased my fair back rally to 750. And I'm not going to do the second polling question, but I'm just going to do the, the first one here real quick. <laughs> Can I sell my relinquished property under my trust name and buy the replacement property, communal property? The answer is you cannot do it because it's a trust. Can investors go separate ways in an exchange? The answer is yes, as long as you do it in 24 months. Can the investor sell their relinquished property and buy a replacement property? Can they hold back cash, capital improvement? The answer is no. So before we go home, let me go back to uh, the slide on the uh, benefits. And I just want to take a poll here. From this term benefits, let's go in the room. Which benefit are you connected more with? Uh, let's go from the back. Uh, let's go in the corner. Which benefit, yeah. From the seven benefits, which one do you like? We'll take a poll. From the seven, yeah. Out of the seven, which one do you think is uh, you're connected with, like you will go through a 1031 exchange out of the seven. What number? Oh, do I have the wrong slide? Okay, right here, yeah. Do you see right here?
Okay, very good. One number? What is it? Okay, more units. Okay, next. Go ahead. Um, better go. Okay, next. Do I mind the value? Okay, next. Say better mix. Better mark value. What else? Better mix. Mix. Okay. Anybody else in back? Let's go down the list, down the row. You? Yeah. I'm sorry. Newer building, newer building, right? Okay, continue. Next. Yeah. Okay, uh, next row. Yeah. Okay, next row. Yeah. I'm sorry. Rising brands. Uh, okay, next, go down. I was going to say more units. Okay. What did you say? I was going to say more units. More units? Okay. Okay. Next. Better location. Got it. Okay. I'm sorry? Rice and rents. Got it. Cash flow. Cash flow. I'm surprised that not until now somebody said cash flow. I'm surprised. But continue. Huh? Really? Okay. Okay. Do cash flow. Cash flow. Okay. Keep going down the road. Next. More units. You said that already. Okay. Next. Market value. Okay. Next. Huh? Better location. Uh, right here. Okay, got it. Next, cash flow. cash flow. Next row. More units. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Rent. 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 Thank you. Next. More units. Better in the mix. Okay. Next. Cash flow. Okay. Here. Huh? More units. More units. Uh, mix. Two more minutes, guys. Oh, all uh, right. Better location. Okay. Oh, it's a better location. Got it. More units. Online, you can uh, chime in online, please. Well, mix. Mix. More units. Cash flow. Cash flow. More units. Online, anybody? Okay, so online, I'm going to choose for you. It's between more units in cash flow. Obviously, the winner here, right? Mm -hmm. who, who chose more units? I agree with you. Why? It's a smart answer, by the way. It's a smart, huh? More you got it. Go ahead. It's more income, and then when you sell it, you also sell it. But it's also more to deal with, and um, you can have a lot of units in a place that doesn't have any industry, and then no one's going to be renting out the streets. We call now, since I'm going to a doctor program, we call that a null hypothesis. That's exactly right what you're saying, right? So that's why when you make decisions, make sure that it's an, an economy or a place where there's enough industry to support those units. Because you don't want to have all these vacancies. He's super smart. I agree with you completely. But 
generally speaking, because there's a lot of demand for housing, that may not be applicable too much, but he's right about that. Anyways, so I want to thank you guys for coming today. I hope that you guys learned. Thank you. And I think you talk to me at any time to the front. And if you want to leave your name and contact information, feel free to reach out anytime. And uh, if you have any more questions, you can stay. And uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. And uh, and I'm your friend.